Hi, my name is Steve Antonuccio, and I'm a retired librarian. I spent 30 years working in both public and academic libraries. I'm also a historian, Colorado historian. I teach history at the Pillar Institute. Um, and this is one of the programs I gave at the Pillar Institute on the life of Captain Jack Nakaga, the Ute warrior chief who lived in Colorado. A fascinating guy, one of the greatest warriors to come out of uh, uh, this area, although he was not born in the state of Colorado. He was born in, in 1840 before Colorado was a state, but he grew up in this region. So I've written a book about my career working in libraries called There's No Such Thing as a Typical Librarian. Um, it's available on Amazon for $20 if you're interested in it. Um, and the book is structured in an interesting way. It's, it's several chapters. I, I, when I was at the Pikes Peak Library District, I did over 100 documentaries on local history. We had our own library channel, cable access channel, we called the Library Channel. Um, and the book is written in such a way where I go into specific chapters about documentaries I produce. And then there's a link to those chapters on YouTube. Um, so if you're interested in purchasing my book, many of the stories I talk about, um, certainly in, in my YouTube presentations are also in the book. Now, the cover of the book shows the, the uh, front of the uh, uh, Carnegie Library, which is connected to the Penrose Library, uh, downtown library. Uh, and it's a wonderful uh, facility. It houses special collections. A lot of the programs that I talk about, the documentaries that I talk about are on YouTube. Many of the still photos are in the collection and also available online, their digital archives. Now, this is Captain Jack, uh, born in 1840 uh, in the territory of Colorado, although it wasn't Colorado at that time. Um, great warrior, uh, one of the greatest warriors to come out of this region and a uh, very intelligent man. He could speak five languages, including English. Um, he was raised by Mormons. Uh, he was sold into slavery to a Mormon family, and that's where he learned English. But he would pretend not to be able to speak English uh, so he could listen to people as they talked about him or talked about the Utes. And it gave him an advantage uh, knowing that uh, he could understand any language, Spanish, uh, Ute, and uh, uh, English. But anyway, in his late 30s, Nakagat, which means man with one earring, had earned his reputation as a respected warrior, most recently as a scout for 15 months with General Crook in the 1876-77 to 77 campaign against the Sioux. Captain Jack Nakagat came to be known by the whites, had grown up orphaned as a mixed-blood Apache Ute, and was later enslaved by a Mormon family. 
He could read and write English and was educated at a Mormon school with white children and attended church with the family. He lived with the family a number of years and then ran away after being threatened to be whipped. Uh, he traveled to Colorado and joined with the White River Utes, where he married a Ute Belle named Tatsika. And she selected Jack during the traditional uh, bear dance. And I'm going to show you a film about the bear dance at the end of this program. But it's kind of like the Sadie Hawkins State Dance. The Utes respected women, uh, certainly uh, women in their tribe, and they allowed them to select their own male partner, which is probably the best thing to do <laughs> in any culture. But it worked out well for the Utes. Um, Jack wore with considerable pride the peace medal given to him by President Johnson on the occasion when he accompanied Chief Huray to Washington for the treaty negotiations in 1868. Now, the 1868 treaty was extremely important in the history of, of the Ute nation, um, and certainly for, for uh, Captain Jack, because he, uh, he, he took it to mean the word of the United States government. And after the treaty, um, he showed his loyalty to the United States by actually fighting in the Great Sioux War um, um, as an uh, Indian scout for General Crook. Jack wore with considerable pride the peace medal given to him by President Johnson on the occasion when he accompanied Chief Uray to Washington for the treaty negotiations in 1868. The captain and his followers, including 200 warriors, many of them with rifles provided by General Crook, lived off by themselves um, at the old agency upstream of Powell, uh, Powell Park. Their favorite hunting ground was North Park off the reservation to the east. Chief Jack was a well-known figure in the late 19th century and known by many different names in literature on the Indian Wars, including Captain Jack and Chief Jack. He was identified as Ute John when he was a scout for General Crook in 1876 during the Battle of Rosebud and Slim Buttes. Jack rescued Captain Guy V. Henry of the 3rd Cavalry, who was seriously wounded during the Rosebud Battle. Had Jack been in the Army and not a Ute scout, he would have been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his bravery in the Rosebud Battle. And that tells you his, about his bravery and tells you about his uh, loyalty to the United States after the 1868 Treaty. Now, I'm a librarian, and I base my presentation on several very good books I want to talk about. Um, the first one was published in two, 2004 by Peter Decker. And it's called The Utes Must Go, Americans' Expansion and the Removal of a People. Uh, and it's an excellent book. It's, it's the best source book on the life of Captain Jack. Although the book is not specifically on the Kagat, he goes into detail about his life. And I highly recommend this. I had the honor to meet Peter Decker. I invited him to uh, my library in, in Pueblo to do a program. Uh, he passed away just last year, but uh, this is an excellent book. I highly recommend it. Very good read. Um, and it goes into detail of, of kind of from the Ute point of view about what happened in what was called the Meeker Massacre. The Utes like to call it the Meeker Incident. Second book is called Hollow Victory. It was published in 1997. It's a little harder to find, but it's an excellent book written by Mark Miller of Wyoming. And it's about the... Uh, uh, White R River Expedition of 1879, and specifically the Battle of Milk Creek. It goes into very detail about who was in the Battle of Milk Creek, the uh, men that were there, the men that received the Congressional Medal, Medal of Honor, and the details of this uh, six-day war um, where they tried to cross into the Ute Nation but were uh, pinned down by Captain Jack and his Ute warriors. The next book, which I think is the best written book of the of the three, it's called Massacre, The Tragedy at White River. And it's written by Marshall Spray, who I had the honor of meeting back in, in 1992. Um, the book was published in 1957. Now, uh, Marshall Sprague was kind of the Stephen Ambrose of his time. He wrote history books about uh, Colorado specifically, but across the United States. Um, and he just did it in such an entertaining way. A very good write, writer. He go into great detail about the different people uh, that were involved in the uh, Meeker massacre, or Meeker incident. Um, and this book covers everything. It's a detailed historical document. 
He wrote it in 57, where uh, there are a lot of historians available who could give him almost a firsthand account of what happened. Um, but I highly recommend it. It's more specific about the battle, Mill Creek, um, and the massacre itself. Now, this is a picture of Marshall Sprague. He died in 1994 in Colorado Springs. He came to Colorado Springs in 1941 to take the cure for tuberculosis. Now, this was before antibiotics, so the cure took a couple of years. Um, a lot of people came out to Colorado Springs because of the dry climate, um, and you had to get a lot of rest. Um, and he was able to survive and flourish in Colorado Springs. Once he uh, got better, um, he became interested in the history. He had been a New York Times writer. He um, became interested in the history of Colorado. He stayed in Colorado and wrote several books, including Money Mountain, which is a history of Cripple Creek. Um, but I had the pleasure to meet with him. I did an interview with him in 1994, uh, 1993, and uh, met his wife, EJ, and, and just a wonderful author, a gift to Colorado in, in terms of the, the books that he wrote. Now, the Utes came to Colorado around 1000. And at that time, they didn't have horses. Uh, they were hunters, always a hunting culture, but they didn't have the uh, certainly the uh, weaponry. They didn't have the guns um, and they didn't have the mobility that the horse uh, gave them. <clears throat> so when the Spanish came to Colorado in the early 1600s, they brought with them the horse. And of all the tribes that adapted to the horse, the, the Utes were the ones that uh, really adopted uh, the horse. Um, they uh, trained them, they raised them, they bred them. Um, it was a, a considered uh, uh, a status symbol in terms of their wealth, how many horses they had. And it was just natural because most of them lived in the mountains that the horse allowed them uh, to move rapidly allowed them to hunt where they wanted to hunt, and certainly uh, the introduction of the rifle, which many of them got uh, um, after the 1868 treaty, but helping out with General Crook in the, in the Sioux War, they supplied them with the best weaponry that was out there, the Winchester rifles, and they were crack shots. Uh, on horseback, they could shoot anything, and certainly uh, uh, from the ground behind the rocks, um, they're just natural in terms of, of, of their horse riding skills, horseback riding skills. And many of the youths grew up on horses. After they were introduced to it, they grew up on horses. So they made quite uh, uh, excellent soldiers uh, when they fought for General Crook. He had the ability to ride anywhere and had the ability to shoot while riding. Now, this is General William Jackson Palmer. Another great man who founded Colorado Springs in 1871, a Civil War vet. A, um, had, he had been a Quaker, raised a Quaker. Um, and it's interesting, you have a Quaker general who was a pacifist, really a pacifist. But he kind of had the balance of, to look at the history in terms of, of slavery. Um, he was an abolitionist and he hated slavery. Um, so he made the decision that uh, in order to get rid of slavery, I'm going to become a soldier. And he was a great soldier. Uh, he uh, uh, was a spy. He would go in the South, pretending he was working for railway companies, uh, spotting out land. Um, eventually, he was arrested for being a spy. And he was put into one of the most notorious prisons in, in the South. Um, and they would have shot him, but they decided to trade him for uh, other Southern spies that were in the North. Uh, but he created the great city of Colorado Springs. And one thing that he did, he, he was very open. Of course, it, the city was found in 1871. The Ute Treaty was signed in 1868. Um, and uh, at that point, the Utes were allies of the United States. But they had free reign to roam across the state. And they loved to come to Colorado Springs because uh, of the stores. They could buy things, uh, buy guns, ammunition. And so if you were to come into Colorado Springs in 1871, it was not unusual to see Utes in the city. Um, in fact, Garden of the Gods was considered their sacred grounds. Manitou Springs, uh, the springs were also considered a sacred place to them. So they were welcome to come into Colorado Springs. And once a year, they would camp at the Garden of the Gods, their, their spiritual center. And here's uh, some Ute tribe members of the Garden of the Gods. And they would also come into the city. You know, you look at this picture, 
it looked like some pretty scary Native Americans visiting Colorado Springs. Uh, in the center of the picture is a Ute uh, chief, Ure, and some of his tribe members. And they all have rifles because they would come in hunting and then come into the springs and, and get materials and, and, uh, and uh, bullets for their rifles. Um, but they had money. They, because of the Treaty of 1868, uh, Uray had a, a salary. He was given an allotment of $1,000 a year. They even gave him a house that, uh, that he lived in with his wife. Um, and so they also, all the tribe members, because of the treaty, received some sort of uh, uh, financial uh, support. So with their money, they would come into Colorado Springs, go to different stores and go shopping. Uray had a modern house, so he would go into town and get modern appliances, stoves, whatever he needed for his home. So it was not unusual for you to come into Colorado Springs and see Ute Indians just uh, walking around freely. And it's an interesting story. This is uh, the wife of General Palmer, Mary Lincoln Queen Mellon Palmer, who she married General Palmer, I think when she was 19 or 20, beautiful young woman. But she came out early to visit uh, the city that uh, General Palmer had founded right after it was right after the city was founded in 1871. And there's an interesting story about when she arrived. And of course, beautiful woman attracted a lot of attention. And uh, she did attract the attention of a, a Ute chief. And in the book, Heritage Years, Francis Wolcott tells about an occurrence during Queen's first visit to Colorado. A young Indian chief leading a string of four handsome Mustangs arrived one morning. Wearing the badge of courtship, the yellow garter, he offered the ponies to Mrs. Mellon, Queen's stepmother, in exchange for the demure 20-year-old to be his wife. When the offer was refused, he retreated, resigned, and disappointed, his horses trailing behind him. So certainly the history of Colorado Springs would have been a lot different had uh, uh, Queen Palmer decided to marry this, this Indian chief. Um, but it gives you an idea of what it was like back then and uh, the fact that the Native Americans and whites whites lived side by side, uh, interacted side by side. So this is the king and queen of the Ute Nation. This is Chief Uray and his wife, Chipita, legendary couple. Um, after the Treaty of 1868, and, and, and Chief Uray was the one who signed the treaty, um, they really had a, a, a what they thought a friendly relationship with the United States government, considered them allies, considered them friends. And Chief Uray was extremely friendly uh, to the, the, the whites in Colorado and, and tried to live a very peaceful life with his wife. Um, by the Treaty of 1868, the Utes agreed to confine themselves within the western portion of Colorado. They surrendered eastern Colorado, southern Wyoming, and northern New Mexico, well over half of their traditional hunting ground. In return, the U.S. government guaranteed to the Utes approximately one-third of the landmass of present-day Colorado, 16 million acres, or about 4,500 acres for each man, woman, and child. Now, this is right after the Civil War, and the population was a lot less than white population was a lot less. But the Ute Nation covered almost a third of the state of Colorado. And this is the home of Chief Uray and Chapita on the Los Pinos Agency on the Uncompagre. And I know it's hard to pronounce, but it's really phonetic. If you, if you look at it, you pronounce it, it's Uncompagre, and it means Red Lake or Redwater Spring. But this tells you his loyalty to the United States because he proudly flew the United States flag in front of his house. Um, and so, again, everything started out fine, <laughs> but they still owned a third of the state. And as Colorado exploded in population, people came out, they wanted to mine the entire, the entire state of Colorado. That's when tensions started to increase and it became more difficult to live side by side with the Ute Nation. And this is the group of Native Americans. Uh, in the middle there on the left is uh, 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 Chief Uray. On the far right is Captain Jack Nakaga. And you can see the medal around his uh, neck, which uh, uh, President Johnson gave to them. But this is the, the treaty that, uh, or, or this is the uh, uh, 
group of individuals that came out to Washington, D.C. to sign the treaty in 1868. Now, the reason why the United States brought them out to Washington, D.C., it was kind of an intimidation ploy because they knew if they put them on a train and they came out east, they would see all the towns in uh, the Midwest and then come to the East Coast and see this huge city in Washington, D.C. And it'd be intimidating. They knew that, you know, there's a lot of white people in this country and that they definitely would rather have a treaty with them than have to fight them because they would lose any battle. They knew that, that they would lose any battle uh, with the United States. And so this is kind of, uh, this is from Marshall Sprague's book, Massacre, but it's a great paragraph about when they came out to Washington, D.C. to sign the treaty. Uray's second treaty trip east in January of 68 was plush, as befitted his greater importance. He had an assortment of Ute chiefs, including Captain Jack, rode the Denver stage to Cheyenne and boarded the new, new Union Pacific cars to Omaha, ferried the Missouri and went on by rail uh, through Chicago to Washington. They stayed two months at the Washington House and ran up a bill of $2,592.37. I love the exact amount that's in, in uh, Marshall Sprague's book. Much of it for Turkish baths. They met President Johnson, General Grant, John Charles Fremont, and scads of other celebrities. They got medals galore and so much candy and cigarettes that they had to buy six suitcases to lug them home. They returned like tourists by way of Boston, Springfield, Massachusetts, and Niagara Falls. At the Springfield Armory, each Ute was given a new rifle. In 1868, the U.S. population was 40 million, and the total Ute population was 4,500. By bringing the Ute leaders to Washington, D.C., the not-so-subtle message was to sign a treaty or be slaughtered off the face of the earth, just like what happened at Sand Creek four years earlier in 1864. And believe me, every Ute man and woman knew about the Sand Creek Massacre. And this is a, a, a illustration of the Sand Creek Massacre, where 250 people were killed, two thirds of them women and children in 1864. And they were flying the United States flag uh, when the cavalry came in and uh, slaughtered them. So it was a horrible, horrible uh, uh, point in Colorado history. So this is a Ute reservation in 1868, and you can see it's pretty much from the, the, the uh, Continental Divide west to the border of Colorado, uh, almost a third of the state of Colorado. And that's what created a lot of the tension. They just had a lot of land. Now, in 1868, it wasn't a problem. But as the population grew uh, later on after the Civil War, uh, it got to be a problem. And that's when the tension started. In 1879, at the time of the Meeker Massacre, there were still around 4,500 Utes living in the new state of Colorado and around 190,000 white settlers. The pressure to remove the Utes from Colorado was intense for the local politicians. Now, this is Nathan Cook Meeker. He was a journalist and founder of the Union Colony that they eventually named Greeley after his mentor and boss, Horace Greeley, uh, passed away. Now, he was very close to Horace Greeley. Um, uh, he uh, uh, certainly admired him, and he decided to go west, just like Horace Greeley told everyone in the United States to go west and seek your fortune. And so Nathan Meeker went west. He founded the, the Union Colony. It was pretty much a failure. They had problems with the irrigation. They had problems with locusts, um, and they really struggled the first few years. In fact, Meeker went into debt. He borrowed money from Horace Greeley. And when Horace Greeley died, he owed that money to his daughters. And he, and he found himself at the age of 65, broke, owing money. And that's why he went and, and uh, tried to uh, get the job as the uh, uh, agent at the White River Agency of the Ute Nation. This is Horace Greeley. Uh, founder and editor of the New York Tribune, he famously said, although it wasn't his original quote, go west, young man, and grow up with the country. So he was a real proponent of manifest destiny, going west and making your fortune um, and populating the western part of the United States. And again, he had a great influence on Nathan Meeker, 
Um, and uh, Nathan Meeker started the Greeley colony because of horse uh, of horse Greeley. Now, this is when the problem started. This is Frederick Walker Pitkin, first governor of Colorado from 1878 to 1883. He was a politician, and there was all kinds of pressure on him to reduce uh, the Ute nation. So many people were coming out wanting to mine, wanting to raise cattle, this luscious land, which included the city of Aspen, what is now the city of Aspen, which was part of the Ute nation. And so he had a plan to pressure the Utes. Um, in 1879, at the time of the Meeker massacre, there were still around 4,500 Utes living in the new state of Colorado and around 190,000 white settlers. The pressure to remove the Utes from Colorado was intense for the local politicians. For Governor Pitkin, the final solution was complete removal of the Utes from Colorado. And to further inflame public opinion against the Ute presence, Pitkin turned to his friend, William Vickers, the editor of the Denver Tribune, to help him in this effort. The Utes must go, Vickers editorialized. The Utes are actually and practically communists, and the government should be ashamed to foster and encourage them in their idleness and wanton waste of property. Living off the bounty of a paternal but idiotic Indian Bureau, they actually become too lazy to draw their rations, but insist on taking what they want whenever they find it. Removed to Indian territory, the Utes could be fed and clothed for about half what it does now cost the government. The broader truism that the only truly good Indians are dead Indians. And this was the saying at the time. And you can imagine the pressure that it put on the Ute nation. And, and, and Captain Jack, who could read and write English, read this these editorials. And he thought, what are, what are you guys doing? Why are you trying to push us off our land? You know, We've shown our loyalty to the United States. So it was a very difficult time for the, the Utes, and, and they were extremely nervous that something was going to happen that would give uh, Colorado, state of Colorado, the excuse to kick them out of the state. And, of course, that's what did happen and ended up with the, the Meeker incident. Now, just to give you a little background, this is General George Armstrong Custer, who died in 1876 during the Great Sioux Wars. Um, he uh, died at Little Bighorn in the middle of the war. And so his replacement was General George Crook, um, who finished the Sioux War. And his secret weapon was Captain Jack, who was his chief scout. They became good friends, in fact. Um, and Captain Jack and his 200 warriors, who were skilled horsemen, who were skilled crack shots, because they were hunters. That's what they did in on, on the Ute Reservation as they would hunt, they were his secret weapon. They're the reason why uh, the uh, Sioux eventually uh, agreed to a peace treaty. And then after the war, General Crook, interestingly enough, uh, became a spokesperson for the Native Americans and defended them and, and, and was really upset that the United States would break treaties with the Native Americans that he worked so hard to make. And of course, this is Captain Jack Nakagat. You can see he's wearing the medal around his neck. He was proud to be an ally of the United States. He was proud that President Johnson gave him the Freedom Medal. Um, and he wore it proudly. But you can see he's a very athletic looking figure. He was a, a great warrior, skilled on, a, on horseback, a born leader, could speak um, four languages fluently and had a brilliant, brilliant mind. And again, he considered uh, General Crook a friend of his, and General Crook considered him a good friend too, because they fought together during the Sioux War. Okay, this is Nathan Meeker. He's the uh, Indian agent at the White River Agency, and he's the cause of the Meeker incident, the Meeker massacre. Um, he wanted to convert the uh, Ute, uh, Native Americans into farmers. They were hunters, natural hunters. They loved hunting. They loved racing horses. And uh, he befriended Chief Johnson, who was the chief of the White River Agency. Um, just like Chief Uray, they built Chief Johnson a house, and Chief Johnson would fly the American flag. Um, but he was very proud of his horses. He had more horses than anyone in the tribe, um, and he would race them, and the pasture was right next to his house. 
Well, Nathan Meeker wanted him to plow up his pasture so they could do more farming. And Chief Johnson refused. And Nathan Meeker went ahead and plowed his uh, pasture up without his permission. And this is what happened. At midday, Chief Johnson approached Meeker outside the office and once again demanded a halt to the plowing. They exchanged angry words. When Meeker threatened Johnson with prison for insubordination, Johnson told Meeker that it would be better for another agent to come who was a good man and not talking such things. Meeker claimed that Johnson dragged him out of his office, throwing him to the ground and re-injuring Meeker's shoulder. On September 16th, six days after Meeker's encounter with Chief Johnson, Major Thomas Thornburg at Fort Steele in Wyoming received orders from the Army headquarters in Omaha to move as quickly as possible with sufficient numbers of troops to assist the agent at the White River Agency. And this is Major Thomas Thornburg, commander of Fort Steele in Wyoming. Um, he was killed in action five minutes after the Battle of Milk Creek began when they crossed the uh, Milk Creek into the Ute Nation. Thornburg had under his command about 175 cavalry and infantrymen, plus 25 or so civilian teamsters. He departed from Fort Fred Steele on September 21st, five days after receiving uh, General Crook's initial order. The Utes were armed with Winchester repeating rifles and the latest models of Sharps, Henrys, and Remingtons. Their weapons fired more quickly and had greater range than the cavalry's 4570 Springfield carbines. Even though the Utes were outnumbered two to one, the Ute warriors were a superior force. They had superior weapons. They were superior marksmen and could shoot accurately on horseback or in a defensive position on the ground as a sharpshooter or sniper. They were master equestrians and were practically born on horseback. Most of them had combat experience and fought with General Crook in the Great Sioux War. They also had one of the greatest and most brilliant military leaders of his time in Captain Jack. And they and finally, they were fighting to protect their homeland, the Ute Nation. Every Ute was very aware of the massacre at Sand Creek, and they knew what the army could do to their women and children and were willing to give their lives to protect them. So even though the, the Utes were outnumbered, they were extremely motivated to protect their own land, and they pinned the, the United States Cavalry down for six days. The Battle of Milk Creek may be unique among battles of the Indian Wars because it was one of the few encounters that was so long that there were periods of relative quiet when daily conversations were possible between opponents. Milk Creek also seemed to have been one of the few battles at which several Indians were bilingual and eager to talk to the soldiers. Some of the Ute warriors had scouted for the Bluecoats, and some, like Chief Jack, had made lasting acquaintances. So they knew each other. They knew each other. Uh, from fighting in the Sioux Wars, and they conversed during the battle. Three hours after the battle began at Milk Creek, 20 miles to the north, our Villa Meeker and her daughter Josie were at home cleaning up the noon meal. Shadrick Price, the post farmer, and Frank Dresser, the young Greeley laborer, had returned to work on the new building nearby where they were throwing dirt and sod onto the roof. Just as our villa had finished her chore, she noticed an Indian gallop into the agency compound and confer with Chief Douglas, who had just finished de dinner with the Meekers. That tells you the relationship with Chief Douglas and the Meekers. They ate dinner together um, on the day of the massacre. Less than an hour later, 20 armed Indians stormed the new building and opened fire on the agency employees. The Indians may have selected Price, the agency farmer, as their first target because of his constant bragging about killing nine Indians on the plains a few years back. Chief Johnson's wife, Susan, took the white women and children to the milk house and protected them as every male agency employee was murdered. The besieged expedition had now been fighting sporadically for three days, and the troopers were beginning to, to tire and run low on supplies. One common thought in the mind of every trooper was, had any of the couriers gotten through? And then Captain Dodge in the 9th Cavalry of around 50 Buffalo soldiers arrived to rescue the besieged troops. Grateful men shouted, leaped from the pits, and greeted the new arrivals with hearty handshakes and cheers. Captain Lawson, a Kentuckian, abandoned his normally quiet demeanor and offered a heartfelt compliment. You men of the 9th Cavalry are the whitest black men I have ever seen. And this is what made the battle even more fascinating, is you had this uh, Buffalo soldier regiment who rescued the cavalry 
um, who were trying to invade the Ute nation. So all these nationalities coming together in this battle. It was 5 a.m. on October 5th, 1879, and the White River Expedition had been under siege for 138 hours, six long nights and six weary days. The men were bone tired, the water they drank was stagnant, and the air they breathed was tainted by gun smoke and the odor of decaying flesh. The past four days, Colonel Wesley Merritt had directed the movements of the final relief force to Mill Creek. Merritt was a successful Civil War general who became a very competent regimental commander on the Western frontier during the Indian Wars. The total relief force included 20 commissioned officers and 234 enlisted men. Men at the besieged barricade cheered, rushed from the trenches and shouted as they ran through the dark to greet their saviors. Kimball recalled that men tumbled out of the pits and ran around in the chilly morning, throwing their arms wildly and falling on one another's necks, showing by every gesture the sudden emotions of their feelings. Now, during the Battle of Milk Creek, which lasted six days, 23 Ute warriors were killed, 11 White River Agency staff were massacred, 13 cavalry soldiers killed, and 44 cavalry soldiers were wounded. Now, what ended the Battle of Milk Creek? Well, it took the intervention of Chief Uray, who knew that this battle would lead to the eventual expulsion of the Utes from Colorado. And so he interceded and tried to get Chief Jack to, to stop, and he sent him a telegram, and it said, to the chief captains, headmen, and Utes at the White River Agency, you are hereby requested and commanded to cease hostilities against the whites, injuring no innocent person or any other, farther than to protect your own life and property from unlawful and unauthorized combinations of horse thieves and desperados. It's interesting you mentioned horse thieves because the, the horses were like children to the, the Utes. They loved their horses. As anything further will ultimately end in disaster for all parties. Signed, Chief Uray. So that ended the battle. These are the women that were uh, still alive. They were kept, and the children. These are the women and children that were still alive that were kept in captivity um, by the, the White River Utes. There's Flora Ellen Price and her two children, and Josephine Meeker, the daughter of Nathan Meeker. Um, and they were protected by Susan, who kept them alive. Now, the governor of Colorado, Governor Pickkin, of course, this was the excuse that he wanted. He kind of wanted this to happen. He wanted an incident to occur. So now he had an excuse to kick, kick the Utes out of Colorado. Although Governor Pitkin knew well that the ambush and massacre must have been caused by the White River Utes alone, population 700. He gave Denver Tribune editor Vickers a free hand to convince the nation that Uray's 1,500 Uncompagres, Ignacio's 1,300 Southern Utes, and even Tabby's 500 Uinta Utes from Utah were equally guilty and were massing for a bloody showdown. Vickers' technique was crude, cynical, and effective. The reporters who camped in Pitkin's Denver office received from Vickers every wild rumor from any Colorado settler anywhere, no matter how absurd for prominent publication as the gospel truth. And so this is why the Utes were kicked out of Colorado. And this is a, a photo of our villa Meeker, Nathan's wife, who also survived the, uh, the massacre. So what they had to end up doing, and certainly Chief Uray knew they didn't really have any choice because there was calls for them to be massacred by the cavalry. And he knew that would happen if they didn't come up with a new treaty. And so he went to Washington, D.C. And, and negotiated another treaty in 1880. With the hope of fair treatment in Washington, the Ute delegation composed of representatives of the White River, the Uncompagres, and one Southern band arrived in Pueblo, Colorado in early January, 1880, for the train to Washington. An angry crowd of 3,000 greeted them with chants, hang the red devil, sh shoot the murdering fiends before an army protective guard could get them safely onto the train. The whites pelted the Indians with stove coal, all the while calling for a lynching of the Ute leaders. In the end, Schurz drew up a non-negotiable agreement for the Utes to sign. The 1880 treaty required both the White River and Uncompadre Utes were to be moved to the Uinta Reservation in Utah. As for the Utes' southern bands, they were to be moved to unoccupied land on the La Platte River in the southwest corner of Colorado 
which they are today. That's where the Ute reservations are today. In return for surrendering their land, the government promised to pay the Utes, in addition to the 25,000 agreed to in previous treaties, 60,000 a year in annuities forever to be prorated among the three bands. The White River Ute Band had to pay out of their share in annuity to the families of the male employees killed in the White River Agency. The three Ute agencies also received an additional 50,000 a year in cash for per capita distribution and a one-time 350,000 appropriation to cover the expenses of their move and their construction of new buildings. Chief Fure, 1,000 a year salary was also extended for an additional 10 years. Uh, but he died a year later. He died right after the, the new treaty was signed. So what happened to Captain Jack, the leader of the, the Ute Nation, a famous Ute warrior chief, Nakaga? Well, he didn't abide by the new uh, Ute treaty. He was, you know, he's not the kind of person to be told what to do, and he never did stay in one place. So he left the Ute reservation. He ended up going to Wyoming, uh, staying at the Shoshone reservation. And word got out where he was, and they sent a contingent of soldiers and surrounded him. And this is what happened. Jack, recognizing his trap, rushed down the stairs holding a knife and bolted out the door. Lieutenant Morgan fired three times at Jack's legs, trying to wound him. He missed. Just before the war chief escaped into a nearby teepee, a mounted trooper took aim at Jack with his carbine and shot him in the arm. Inside the teepee, Jack gathered up his own carbine and some ammunition. From a distance, the troops surrounded the teepee. The army officer ordered two soldiers to tie several lariats together and sling a loop over the teepee and pull it over Jack. From his hiding place, Jack immediately recognized the ploy. Jack ran from the back of the teepee to another where he took cover from soldiers' volley of bullets among some bales of buffalo robes. As Jack suffered from his wound silently and bled slowly, the troops waited. Thinking Jack had lost consciousness from the loss of blood, the army officer ordered his sergeant to advance slowly and cautiously on the teepee. As the soldiers approached the front opening, Jack fired and dropped the sergeant with a well-aimed bullet through the heart. The other troops fired into the teepee as they sought cover among some trees. Clearly, Jack would not surrender peacefully. The lieutenant sent two troopers back to the post with the dead sergeant and a message to Major Mason for reinforcements. They placed the howitzer in front of the teepee and fired, and Jack was blown to pieces and killed instantly. Immediately after the shell exploded, the troops rushed the teepee and collected into a salt bag the few body parts of Jack they could identify. Very unfortunate end to this amazing warrior, amazing, amazing soldier, loyal to the United States during the Sioux War, should have received the Congressional Medal of Honor and was loyal uh, to the U nation in preventing the cavalry from entering their land. Um, it's just a sad, sad ending. So what happened to the Ute tribes today? Well, they're basically in the same location after uh, was what was negotiated in the 1880 treaty. There's three res reservations, one in Utah, two in Southern Colorado. The one in Utah is the original Uinta reservation. It's a Uinta and Uray reservation. And that's in uh, central North Utah where there are 3,500 tribe members that live in that reservation. And then there's two in uh, Southern Colorado, just on the border, the Southern Ute Reservation. First, there's a Ute Mountain Tribe Reservation with 2,000 tribal members. You can see it there on the left side of the state of Colorado. They have their own uh, casino that they run to help generate uh, uh, money. And the other one is the Southern Ute Reservation, um, which is, you know, of course, they stuck them on the worst land in Colorado in 1880. But it turns out that their land is on uh, one of the most valuable natural gas reserves in the nation. Two billion dollars in natural gas reserves where 1,500 tribal members live fairly uh, uh, decent life because they get a nice annuity from those uh, uh uh, from the natural gas reserves. Ironically, the Southern Utes today are recognized primarily for their wealth. The 1,500-member tribe sits on one of the biggest supplies of natural gas in the United States and have assembled over a $2 billion energy conglomerate. I just want to emphasize how important is it, it, it is to me to tell the story of Captain Jack Nakaga, because nobody knows about him today. You know, some of the Ute people Shoot, you tribe members know who he was and what a great man he was, but uh, 
basically he's been lost in history. And to paraphrase what Hyman Roth said about Mo Green in Godfather II, this was a great man, a man of vision and guts, and there isn't a plaque or signpost or a statue of him in the state of Colorado. Nakagat was an American hero for his bravery during the Great Sioux War and a Ute hero for his leadership and bravery during the Battle of Milk Creek. Now, this is the cultural center that's on the Southern Ute Reservation. Like I said, they're the, one of the wealthiest uh, tribes in the country because of their natural gas reserves. And this is a marker at the uh, site of the Meeker incident or Meeker massacre. This area was site of the White River Ute Indian Agency where the US government agent Nathan Meeker and his male employees were massacred, women and children captured by Utes, September 29th, 1879. Then again, here's a, a plaque uh, dedicated to Nathan Meeker, but nothing to the great man, the great man, Ute Indian chief, Captain Jack Nakaga. And of course now, what used to be the Ute land of the White River Agency is now Aspen, Colorado, Pit Pitkin County, um, of course, which is a very wealthy area, one of the wealthiest, one of the most expensive real estate in the country. And again, you can uh, invite you to read my book. There's no such thing as a typical librarian. Uh, one more thing I wanted to add, um, I wanted to mention that I would be happy to give this program uh, to your school or group on Captain Jack McCoggott. Um, You can just contact me at my email, anton1492 at gmail.com. And I'd be glad to give this program for free on Zoom, or if you want me to travel, if you pay for my travel expenses. Um, the last thing I wanted to do is I wanted to show you a bear dance uh, that was filmed in Woodland Park by my friend uh, Jim Chaletti in 1988. And it shows you this, this beautiful ceremony. Like I said, it's like the Sadie Hawkins Day dance uh, where the uh, women select the men to be their dance partner. And many times it ends up uh, to being their marriage partner as well. But it's a beautiful, positive little film. Uh, so please enjoy. Today is a very special day for me. Today is Bear Dance Day. The Bear Dance opens when my grandfather, Eddie Box Sr., blesses the grounds so that people have a good year and will just stand up and be strong. My grandfather makes a tobacco offering to the West north, east, and south. Bear dance is when my people get together to celebrate the opening of spring. The bear dance is a lady's choice because the female uh, bear had handed down to the, uh, the people to honor the f women of the tribe.
When I see the women coming towards me, I'm not really sure which one's going to get me or if I'm going to get picked at all. It's just a, a moment just to wait and see what happens. It doesn't matter who picks you. I have respect for any woman that cares to dance with me. It's really nice just to go out and dance. You feel calm at first, waiting for the music to start. And when it starts and the rumbling goes on, and then you wait for the woman to make their move and start the dance off. And then after that, you wait for the cat man to come. And that's the most, the most, for me, exciting for me because you go across on your own. You're dancing with the woman that picked you. You're not with the men holding hands and the woman's not holding hands and they're not dancing back and forth. You're going just you and the woman. And that's a really tense moment, whether you're gonna talk or there's times when the woman won't talk to you or you won't talk to her, it's just dancing. But most of the time, you'll kind of turn to her and she'll turn to you and you're face to face right there and you've never danced with her before. And first, you know, usually ask what your name is, but you know, I've had off the wall questions about the weather and stuff. <laughs> I find that the women are just as shy as the men are. And, uh, they're nervous, women are nervous to dance with you just as you are. I am proud to be a you. Well, the youth people have always respected the bear because our legends say that the uh, youths came from the bear and we don't uh, eat bear meat and we respect the bear and we have our bear dances because of this in the spring because the bear has always come out in the spring because the bear is one of the one of the powers that the, that the great spirit has given us the traditional dress for the bear dance for women is a cloth dress cut in the wing pattern and beaded moccasins, beaded belt with earrings, and some may have their hair ties on in their hair, and the fringe shawl. Yes, I make a new dress every year for the bear dance because the flowers come out to bloom and there's rebirth everywhere, and that's what my new dress represents. Well, one summer I spent a lot of time with my grandmother when she, when she talked to me about, you know, the relationships between a female and a male and, you know, the do's and the don'ts. You have your limits, he has his limits. 
you respect what he has to do and he has to respect what you have to go through. There's many things that you have to respect in a person, especially when they're culturally active. The red earth paint was given to me by my grandfather who passed away maybe seven years ago. Well, when I wear the red earth paint, I am representing the earth, Mother Earth, and the prayer of my grandfather, which comes with the paint. My moccasins um, mean a lot to me because my relatives made them, and just my relatives made my moccasins. So while I'm dancing, it's like my relatives are dancing along with me. Asking a man to dance makes me feel like I can take charge of things a little more in life than being having to wait for another person to ask me. Well, you find out which person is in sync with the music or you can tell by which people are in harmony with life because you get one person and he's off beat. You know something's wrong there. Or you can pick a person who's right with the beat and he knows you, he moves with your body, you both move together, there's something there. It makes things easier. It symbolizes that, you know, if you two people were to ever get together, that there would be something there. And there was one time for me when there was a person who I found in the Bear Dance Corral. I feel a lot of pride because, you know, I mean, I'm really glad to be you because I go out and I represent the three different bands, which is in my blood. So when I go into the nation's capital or even just to our state capital, I think of, you know, the warriors that fought with the government to try to protect our lands and our hunting grounds and our rights. I'm thankful for the time that they kept the land as long as they did. I think the only way that we'll ever make our culture become stronger is to start it in with the youth again. The older people, they said that not to get jealous when your wife's dancing or your husband's dancing. Be good and trust each other. That way you live long together. You care for one another more. The bear dance is fun because you dance and you just have a good time. And it's kind of fun seeing who's going to pick you. I am proud. I am proud. I am proud to be a youth. Today is a very special day for me. Today is Bear Dance Day. <laughs>